こんばんはようこそ。こんにゃは日本でおこたいくつかのおろしり。話について話します。Alright then, thank you Google Translate for that absolutely butchered Japanese intro. Sorry about that. I just wanted to have a little bit of fun. So, tonight we've got some horror stories from Japan, something amazing that I've never done before. I'd like to thank, before we begin, our collaborator in tonight's video. Please don't just jump ship. He has a really good, amazing voice. I love it. Obviously, he speaks Japanese because he translated these stories. And yeah, I think he's got an awesome channel, and you guys definitely should at least hear him out today. And if you enjoy it, well, you know, go check out his channel too. I think he's doing some really cool and original stuff. So, all of these stories are from Japan. Thank you, Japanese Nightmares, for translating these and being a part of this. It was awesome to work with you. Be sure to check out his channel when we're done. Link in the description. And of course, at the end, as always. All right, then, guys, it's time to dive in. The, the, the stories will be in English from now on, I promise. So for now, get comfortable and let the darkness take control. My hobby is mountain hiking. The kind of mountains I like to hike are ones with no roads, no other people, and where wild vegetables grow, off the beaten track. Sometimes on these hikes I come across strange or unusual things. For example, I once saw an albino antelope, and on another occasion saw an eagle the size of a grown man. However, the weirdest incident was the time I came across a family, impossibly far into the mountains. It was a weekend afternoon. And I was hiking along the prefectural border between Miyagi, Yamataga, and Akita. There was a forest full of huge beech trees, which made it quite easy to walk as it got dark. This is a place that not an everyday person would hike. Only local people to this mountain range would probably know about it, or people like me who enjoy hiking and have GPS. It was secluded. As I was walking along a small ridge, I noticed a small stream flowing below. At the edge of the stream, I saw a man standing there. I first thought, ah, he must be doing a spot of fishing. But then I noticed that he wasn't alone. Four other people stood with him. They were all standing in the river. I couldn't see clearly because I must have been about a hundred meters away, but I was sure that there were four people standing there. Two appeared to be children. I didn't know why, but I thought they might be on the verge of committing a family suicide. I mean, to come all the way out here to this secluded mountain river alone, so close to dark. If that was the case, I planned to intervene and talk them out of it. I hoped that wouldn't be the case, but either way, I was interested in finding out what was going on. So I used my binoculars to take a closer look. Just as I thought, four people facing away from me. Two children and two adults. I watched for a moment, waiting for them to turn my way so I could catch a glimpse of their faces, but they didn't move at all. I must have been watching them for five minutes, and yet they didn't move. Then it dawned on me they're mannequins. Someone must have put them here as a prank or as a trap. I decided to go in for a closer look, since my first thought was to check on the family anyway. I quietly crept closer and didn't want to be noticed. In my mind, I was planning my escape route. Jumping in the river itself crossed my mind if something terrible were to occur. As I drew closer, my predictions came true. There were four mannequins before me, two adults and two children, all dressed up out here in the middle of nowhere. I was disgusted. My body shivered. I couldn't think logically why they would be here. I thought to myself, whoever did this must not be right in the head. I was now close enough to see the details on the mannequin. Each one had a name printed on its front. Each mannequin was peppered with small holes like bullet holes, like a shotgun bullet trail. The piece de resistance was a broken box cutter blade sticking out of one of the child mannequin's backs. That was enough for me. I was terrified and began to make it back down the mountain. And even as I write this now, I'm shivering. Those creepy mannequin dolls with marks up and down them. Someone carried them all over there to do whatever they did to them, but why? These were not light mannequins either, they were bulky, heavy wooden ones. If I had to carry them myself, 
I would have to have stopped for a while to take a rest, but there were four of them. Must have taken forever to get there. This all happened two years ago. I guess they're still there. This happened when I was a high school student, during summer vacation. My friends and I wanted to make some memories, so we decided to have a barbecue. We set up our barbecue in a field. One of my friends said that there was an abandoned hospital nearby. Because I had never gone ghost hunting or anything like that, I was up for checking out the abandoned hospital. We were all pumped up for some late night urban exploration. We decided to inspect the hospital at around 11 p.m. I don't know how long ago the hospital was built, but it was really old. It was crumbling down in places. We approached the entrance and my friend said, guys, it's easy if we go in as a big group, but that's boring. So let's split up. So we split up into smaller groups of three. The first group were ready to go in. And then after a little while, the second group was set to go in. I was in the first group. The atmosphere, even in the entrance, was so heavy. Do you know what I mean? My heart was thundering in my chest. However, the doors were locked. I thought that maybe we could break down the door if we tried, but the other lads didn't fancy it. I decided to look around the perimeter for a weak spot to gain access. I found that one of the walls had collapsed around the back. I could see inside. I let the others know, and we decided to go in through there. We were in. It was humid in there. The air was moist and damp. There wasn't the usual stuff you would expect in an abandoned hospital. There were no syringes, patient charts, or doctor equipment. The walls were just covered in mad scribblings. They didn't make much sense. There were beds, and something was placed on top of one of the beds. Some twisted shape beneath a black cloth. It creeped me out. And there were these origami cranes strewn around the place. I thought about why they might be there. Maybe someone put them there for some reason I don't understand. Really weird. We crept through the hallway until we came to a room with a closed door. I pushed it open, and that's when we saw it. A doll in front of something like an altar. Like a crude offering. The doll was quite big. It was tattered and raggedy. We went closer to it. None of us wanted to be the first person to say, let's go. But I could tell my friends wanted to get out of there, just as much as I did, and as quickly as possible. There was a cup in front of the doll. There were two leaves in the cup. There was a green plate with something black on it. I looked into that doll's eyes, and in that moment, I was terrified. I had to get out of there immediately. We went back to the barbecue area and started to pack our things away. I called one of my friends in the second group to see how they were getting on. Back at the barbecue, my friends and I didn't say anything for a while until one of them said, that altar was really messed up. I hated that doll. It gave me such a weird feeling, I replied. Was it an offering of some kind? We all saw the doll in the first group, but no one in the second group saw the doll. Perhaps there were other things in there like that. It was honestly the weirdest place I had ever been. By the next week, all three of us who had seen the doll had ended up with an injury. I broke my little finger during PE. My friend got into a motorbike accident and broke his toe. The other friend got into another accident involving a motorbike, and he crashed and he was in the hospital for days. The teacher asked us while laughing, What's happened to you three? You cursed or something? We felt that it was no laughing matter. Even to this day, that abandoned hospital still stands. It hasn't been demolished yet. But a sign that reads, Keep Out, has been put up, and a large metal fence surrounds it. Don't go looking for it. Don't go in there. This happened when I was 25. 
I'm a female, and had been dating a guy for about a year. Things were going great, and he asked me to meet his parents, and invited me to have dinner at their family home. It was at his parents' house, where something unimaginable happened. My boyfriend was from the countryside, and his family still lives there. From where I lived, it took three hours to arrive by car. When I finally got to meet them, my boyfriend's attitude towards me changed dramatically, and it really surprised me. He was usually quite the gentleman, but in front of his parents, he addressed me with such terms like you and oi. It was downright rude. He'd shout at me using these words like he was commanding me or something. He'd never treated me like this before, but since I was in his parents' home, I would put up with it, and gave him the benefit of the doubt. I mean, what else could I have done? I didn't want to make a scene and embarrass him. I could see where he got it from. His dad was throwing his weight around and bossing everyone. His father shouted commands at his mum when she was doing something not quite to his liking, and it was pretty harsh. I looked over at her and she just kept her head down and did what she was told, like this was totally normal. His family were giving off some seriously suspicious vibes, and I was starting to regret coming here at all. It felt so awkward and intimidating. At dinner, his father stared at me and said, When you get married, you will live here. It caught me off guard. It wasn't a question. It wasn't a joke. It was a demand. I just focused on cutting up my food and waiting for my boyfriend to speak up for me, but he never did. So eventually I said, well, I haven't made any decisions about that yet. His dad glared at me. He looked so angry. If you marry my son, you live here. Got it? I couldn't believe it. He shouted at me, a guest. I stared at my boyfriend. He must have felt my eyes pleading with him for some sort of help or defense, but he was just as silent as his mother. It killed me when he looked at his father and just nodded. More to the point, my boyfriend had never mentioned marriage to me before, so I was totally shocked. And to be honest, our relationship had had its rocky moments. They started speaking of specific dates for a wedding, and the pressure was intensifying. Later after dinner, when I was alone with my boyfriend, I said, Hey, I feel a bit sick. I want to go home. Something isn't quite right. He didn't say anything, so I decided to start gathering up my things and head home alone. Just as I turned to leave, he grabbed my arm. Are you running away? He boomed. He had totally changed. It was like I didn't know him at all. He forced me back into his childhood bedroom. He overpowered me and shut the door on me and locked it. I beat on the door and screamed for someone to let me out. I was making so much noise, there was no way that no one else in the house wouldn't have heard me. Things got worse when I realized that I had left my phone on the chair downstairs, charging. I couldn't do anything. I was literally a prisoner. I was stunned. And after a while, the door unlocked, and my psycho boyfriend's mum entered the room. I was pleased to see her. I thought she had come to my aid, but my hopes were dashed instantly when she handed me some papers. Sign this. It's your marriage certificate. If you do, you can go, she said in a monotone voice. It was the real deal. I won't sign that. I'll never marry him. You think you can escape? Go on, try. She asked me to sign it again and I told her where do I go. She got up and walked out the room and locked the door again. I needed to stay calm. I was terrified, sure, but I needed to keep my composure if I had a chance of leaving. I decided to wait until the dead of night, turned all the lights off in the room and kept as still as possible. Before shutting off all the lights, I figured the window would be my best and only option for escape. I would have to deal with injury if it happened. I opened the window and managed to climb down onto the porch roof silently. It was amazing. I walked all the night and reached the nearest train station. Fearing for my safety, I looked over my shoulder for that crazy mother and father. Days and weeks passed after this incident, and I got an email from my boyfriend asking, You think that's the last of this? You think you can get away? We will not forgive you. Because I was living on my own at the time, I was too afraid to go back to my apartment alone. I asked friends and relatives to let me stay with them, and pleaded. One friend who lived quite far from where I met my boyfriend allowed me to stay with them and I felt safer. With the help of a lawyer and a support group, I achieved what he told me was impossible. I escaped from him and his family. I heard from friends and neighbors from my old life, 
and they say that they've seen him hanging around my former apartment and my old hangouts. Even though I live miles away from him now, I'm still worried he'll find me, or find a way to hurt me and my family. A long time ago, my dad was seeing another woman behind my mum's back. A few years later, he decided to break it off with his mistress. This caused her to become mentally unstable. My sisters and I would occasionally see her stood on the road near our school, acting strange. She frightened us. My sisters were able to ignore her with ease, but I somehow felt sorry for her. She spoke to me occasionally, and when my sisters weren't there, I would always reply. After a while, she would say things like, You're such a good girl. You're the best out of your sisters. One day, to my surprise, she gave me a Jenny doll. I was overjoyed. Since I am the youngest of my siblings, I would always get their hand-me-downs. I never had something new, something of my very own. Now this wasn't some old tattered doll, no. This was a brand new Jenny doll, just for me. I didn't want my sisters to get their hands on my new doll and take her for their own. Furthermore, I was sure that they would tell on me and mum and dad would take Jenny away. I decided not to tell them about the doll. But because my father's mistress was mentally unstable, she didn't really care what kind of trouble she caused me. She became obsessive. She tried to give me a huge amount of Jenny products. A hair salon, a playhouse, seven more Jenny dolls. Every day she would be waiting for me on the way to school. It was all too much and her behavior scared me. So I began to avoid her. I changed my route. After a while she stopped waiting for me on the way to school. And eventually, I went back to walking my usual route to school again. I was happy. But one morning, I saw her again. I didn't feel the usual kindness she had projected before. Something had changed. She was very calm and still. Totally the opposite of how she had been before. Her face was pale, and her smile was now thin. I couldn't really see much of her face, as it was hidden beneath the brim of her big hat and sunglasses. She was carrying two huge overnight bags by her side. In one of the bags, a box was poking out, somewhat intentionally. Immediately I recognized the box's shape. I was sure that it was a Jenny doll box. I have to go away. I'm going far away. Please accept this as a parting gift, she said as she offered the box to me. It was a Jenny doll, one that I hadn't seen before. It was a Jenny with long black hair. I hurried along to school. I was so eager to show everyone my rare new Jenny. Honestly, I couldn't wait to start boasting. Some horrid boy snatched the box from me at school. He tore it open and pulled my new rare Jenny's head off. I was mortified. Some of the girls at school managed to get Jenny back from the boy and they returned her to me. I held her head in my hands, and I saw weed-like clumps of someone's black hair jutting from beneath her chin. It didn't look right. One of the girls who returned the doll pinched a clump of the hair. At first, a huge curled-up wad of hair came out, followed by long, trailing strands. We watched as the hair from Jenny's scalp slowly started to become unraveled. A crowd of children gathered round to get a closer look. Hair from her head was disappearing from the scalp as the girl tugged on the clump of hair. Someone noticed small blood clots attached to the roots of the hair. It was definitely human hair. But this wasn't hair that was cut, but hair that was torn from someone's head. We all stared at the doll. Suddenly, we were all screaming in horror. I felt so scared and so bad inside, I was revolted. 
I began to cry. Others around me were crying too, even the boy who ripped Jenny's head off. We were inconsolable. The teachers had to cancel our following lesson. The teachers called an assembly, and we were all given a serious talk about that incident. We were reminded of the importance of not receiving gifts from strangers, and to be aware of perverts. I was made to state before my teachers and my parents, who were called in from work, I will not take things from strangers and I will be careful of perverts. Neither my parents nor teachers would say that the pervert was my father's ex-mistress. It was just a word used to distance us all from my father's personal situation. To this day, whenever I see a Jenny doll, I feel sick and frightened, especially the new ones with black hair. When I was at university, I had a good friend who was really good looking, but she never had a boyfriend or showed any interest in men. I was very curious about this, so I asked her the reason why I never saw her with a boyfriend. She said there were two reasons. She told me she had a boyfriend in high school who became obsessed with her. When she couldn't take it any longer, she spoke to him about mutually ending the relationship. He exploded with rage and attacked her. The second reason, before university, she commuted to school on the train. One day she found something in her bag, a mysterious sealed envelope. She guessed that someone slipped it into her bag aboard the crowded train. The letter was very simple and only said a few words, love at first sight. It was a creepy kind of love letter. It wasn't addressed to her. It didn't have her name written on it. The envelope just creeped around. Thereafter, she found a new letter in her bag each week. She said she did nothing to encourage these letters. Since this freaked her out, she stopped traveling to school on train. A few days after, she received a phone call from a number she didn't recognize. Oh God, she thought, this is freaky. She didn't answer the call, but saved the number as stalker. A few days passed and she set up an answer phone to see if the stalker would leave a message. And she was surprised that they did. Her hands were shaking when she listened. Why did you go away? Why did you leave me? She said that she began to develop a fear of leaving the house and a fear of men. It took her years to recover from the fear instilled in her, not only from her ex-boyfriend, but the train stalker too. Once she had her confidence back, she attended university. I wanted to help her get a sense of trust in men again, as there are so many good men out there. I knew that I was meddling, but I wanted to help so I thought I would invite her to a party with males and females in attendance. I floated the idea to her and she reluctantly accepted. The day of the party arrived, I invited some of my best friends and male friends who I trusted and warned them all of my friend that she was nervous and asked them to be on their best behavior. My friends understood and promised to make the atmosphere great for the party. The party was held by our college mentor. I was so proud of her she spoke to a man for the first time in a very long time and they had a really lengthy conversation. It was good and healthy to see. The guy she spoke to had the exact same taste in music and movies as she did, to the point where they had the same favorite song. They even came from the same area. They could have talked all night they had so much in common. And I felt like fate had brought them together. When the party was over, he asked her for her contact. I knew this was going to be a big step and I could tell she was happy with this, but she was too shy to show it. She said to me after the party on the way home that she was so happy and that she could fall in love with anyone else now. I was happy for her and felt just as excited as she did. A few days later, she received an email from him. She was pleased as you can imagine, and I respected him for taking things slowly. After a week of emailing, she came running into my room to tell me that he had invited her on a date. The day of the date arrived and my friend didn't want to be late. So she left her home with plenty of time. He sent an email stating, I'll be there shortly and I'll let you know when I arrive. My friend decided to wait for him in the cafe. The cafe was crowded. So she emailed him with her number and asked him to call her when he got there. 15 minutes later and her phone rang. It's him, she thought gleefully. And as she pulled out her phone, 
one word appeared on screen. Stalker? Her heartbeat rose. Old familiar thoughts and fears crept forcing from the back of her mind. She calmed herself and told herself, I'm okay. My boyfriend's coming. I'll be safe. She decided to answer the phone. Hello? Hi, I'm here. Where are you? It was the voice of the man she'd met at the party. Her new boyfriend. There was no mistake. He must have been the ones who put the letters in her bag on the train. She called me as she was leaving and said, I have no luck with men. She escaped the letter stalker with the help of her friends and colleagues. I don't know what they did, but they made him back off. I'm shocked and somewhat in awe at the stalker's fascination and persistence with my friend. I wish he had just left her alone. This happened when I was at high school. I belonged to a basketball club. I developed a huge crush on a senior at the club. We ended up getting very close. We'd often meet in private. One day, off from school, he called me, asking if I wanted to come over and hang out. Of course, I was over the moon to be invited to his home. So I asked him for the address straight away. Uh, I'm actually outside your house, so why don't you come out and I'll just take you there. I went outside as quickly as I could. There was a car waiting outside our family home. There was some weird guy I hadn't seen before, sat with my crush in the car. I got in the car and he spun around and said to me, let's go have some fun. And with that, we pulled away. I wondered where the hell we were going or what we were going to do as the car rumbled through the countryside roads. The car suddenly stopped and my crush blurted out. Oh, I have something I really have to do. I'll be back as soon as I can. And then he left me. Oh my God, why are you leaving now? I thought, but I trusted him to be right back just as he said. I felt lost and confused, but I just tried to enjoy the drive. After a while, the car stopped and we arrived at a house. I knew it wasn't my crushes, as the nameplate outside was different. The guy in the car then asked, Why don't we uh, go in and have a drink while we wait? I felt obliged to accept this offer, since he was friends with my crush, and I didn't want to look bad. When we got inside, something was wrong. I was getting a very bad vibe. Loads of my new acquaintances' friends were sat around a table. It really freaked me out. Why was I brought here? I wondered. The people there were being nice to me there. Before long, night came. I had mentioned a few times my desire to go home before it got too late, yet no one batted an eyelid to this request. I really started to worry now, so I kept saying, I want to go home soon. I had an incoming call from my mum. One of the guys there went crazy at me when I excused myself to answer it. He snatched the phone out of my hand. This was no longer a friendly or normal situation. The man who took my phone told me I wouldn't be going anywhere. I judged the situation as best I could and came to the conclusion that I had been sold by my crush to these strange men. Perhaps they were small-time Yakuza or something. It seemed as if I would be spending the night here. Possibly longer. My heart ached. I just wanted to see my parents again. It's a feeling I wouldn't wish on my worst enemies. Before I knew it, I was bawling my eyes out. They put me in another room and told me to sleep. I tried to think on my feet. I opened the door as quietly as I could. I listened to the men's conversations. It went something like this. Will we get a good price for her from them? The poor thing. It's fine. I couldn't believe I was listening to them discussing my future. I pretended to sleep in the bed. I couldn't do anything else. I resigned myself to my fate. I had come to terms with the idea that I wouldn't see my parents or friends ever again. I tried to prepare myself psychologically for whatever would happen next. After a sleepless night, I saw the early light of morning. I needed the bathroom, so I opened the bedroom door and went in search. My heart was pounding. On the way, I bumped into one of those men. I don't want to do this, but if you try to escape or go somewhere I can't see you, then... Uh, 
he trailed off. I won't try and escape, I whimpered. I apologized from the bottom of my heart to my parents. My life in abduction went on this way for about a week, until one night I was forcibly woken from my sleep, dragged out to a car so violently by the man who picked me up originally. I was pushed in, the engine started, and we pulled away. I had no idea where we were heading. To a buyer, I guessed. It was so hard for the last days and nights to escape reality. I couldn't even comfort myself with family memories as it was just too painful. I felt as if I was losing my mind. I was ready to die. I couldn't physically cry anymore. I was absent-mindedly gazing out of the passenger side window when I noticed familiar things from my neighborhood. Then the car pulled to a stop in front of my house. Go, the man said. I got out and he pulled away into the night. He must have felt some sympathy for me, or his conscience kicked in. To this day, I have no idea what caused his change of heart. I was dumbstruck to be returning home so safely. I went inside my family home, a place I thought only moments ago I would never see again. My mother rushed downstairs. She must have heard me come in. She was so angry. Because I was young and stupid, I thought that telling her about my abduction would get me into more trouble or make her worry, so I just told her I'd been staying with a friend. She screamed at me for not getting in touch with her at least once during that last week. My mother still doesn't know what happened, and it's ten years later. When I went back to school, I couldn't find a trace of that senior. My crush, who had gotten me into that mess. He must have left town before handing me over to those guys. I hope he can't sleep at night. I hope he's tormented and tortured by his guilt. It was a truly terrifying event. But I'm lucky to say that I live very well these days, and I live happily. I'm going to warn you now, if you're easily triggered, please consider stopping here. This is true and a real experience which happened while I was delivering newspapers early one winter's morning. It was around four and it was freezing. I was out on my usual paper route delivering newspapers. The whole neighborhood was still shrouded in complete darkness. The bitter winds were blowing strong. I was approaching an apartment block with my papers and as I was heading out to a dark corner of the building, I heard a voice and it sounded like people were talking. What the hell were people doing up at this hour out in the cold, I wondered, and squinted my eyes in order to get a better look. As I drew closer, I saw there was a woman doubled over and crouching in the hallway before me. Instantly, I knew something was wrong. As I got closer, I noticed that all the woman was wearing was her underwear. Why was she out here in the freezing midwinter morning, alone with no clothes on? She was shivering. I went over to her and asked her what happened, if she was okay or if she needed any help, but she wouldn't reply. I couldn't stand to see her like that. Before long she would freeze, her lips were already beginning to turn blue. I took my coat off and tried to put it around the woman and she pleaded with me not to give her the coat and tried to push it off. She muttered something about if her husband saw her with the coat she'd be in trouble. In that moment I knew I had to do something. I suspected domestic violence and I called the police. While I waited for the cops to arrive, I waited with the woman by her front door. She still wouldn't say a word. I didn't know how long she'd been out there. It was truly sad and haunting to see that woman alone in her underwear on a dark, cold winter morning. While we were waiting for the police, her front door burst open, her husband came rushing out, and he started shouting at her. She cowered as he threw a punch at her. And I obviously intervened and thankfully I was strong enough to protect her until the police arrived. The woman broke down, told them that this wasn't the first time that he had forced her onto the cold in just her underwear. So it seems like this kind of thing happened all the time, which made me sick to my stomach. I've always tried to see the best in people, but this incident rocked my confidence in human beings being decent. I mean to throw your half naked wife out into the cold Humans are the worst. This terrible thing happened about 15 years ago. I was 20 years old 
and living alone. I came home from work, checked the post as I usually do, and found a sealed letter. It was a blank envelope. Inside, there were two tickets to a concert and a letter. A love letter. The writer's feelings for me were quite clear. It went something like this. Let's meet at the concert. I'll keep my identity hidden until we meet. I'm sure you'll be surprised. I'm someone you know. I had a boyfriend at the time, and I had no idea who wrote that. I thought for a moment that I won a competition or something. I remembered that I entered one. But then I remembered that I had entered that competition only this morning, so there's no way that the tickets could be in my letterbox by the evening. Something wasn't right, so I didn't go to the concert. I thought that if it truly is someone that I know, as soon as they reveal themselves to me, then I'd apologize, and I'm sure if they are a decent and kind person, they'd understand my caution. The day after the concert, I found a threatening looking letter stuffed into my letterbox. Why didn't you come? You idiot! Don't pretend like you aren't interested. This is BS. The first letter was gentlemanly in a sense, but this was the complete opposite. Back then, mobile phones weren't so common. As soon as I returned home from work, the moment I closed my front door, my home phone rang. I picked it up, and the other party hung up. This happened often. I didn't get a call or letter every single day. It was irregular. I would get one a week, and then the next week I'd get three or four. This kind of thing went on for about three months. It was so creepy that I ended up moving away. Finally, peace. Well, that's what I thought. Until one month after I moved into a new place, the same thing started again. I didn't get a call this time, but I found another blank envelope in my letterbox. There was no sender's address or name, so it must have been posted by hand. When I saw this, it was clear to me that I had a stalker, and the stalker had found my new home. I was really scared. I took the letter to the police station and spoke to an officer. Ignoring the other party is the most effective thing you can do. As soon as he realizes that he's being ignored, he will stop. This advice doesn't solve anything, I thought. Then the officer said, Look, women who live alone often get lonely, right? And sometimes single ladies have a tendency to allow harmless antics to get blown out of proportion. Hmm? He laughed and thought I was delusional. Back in those days, the word stalker wasn't widely recognized in Japan. The laws in place aren't what they are today. I felt so sad that he didn't try to help me. He didn't back me up. It was like he took the stalker's side. I'll just move again, I thought. But around that time, my boyfriend and I were talking about marriage. So I moved back to my parents' house while we talked it over. My parents' home was in the same prefecture, but it was way out into the sticks, so commuting to work was a real pain. But I thought, eh, at least I'd be rid of the stalker. I was wrong. Carnage and bloodshed were right around the corner for me. I finished work and headed towards the train station. On the way, a man stood blocking my way. When I tried to go one way, he stood in that way, and when I tried to go the other, he blocked me again. He towered over me. He was peering down at me. His jaw hung open, and he was breathing through his mouth. It's him. It's my stalker, I thought. But I didn't recognize him. Why didn't you come? He muttered. For a moment, I didn't know what the hell he was talking about, and then suddenly I remembered. The tickets. I knew he wanted an answer, but I couldn't say a word. It was rush hour. People were all around us. I wasn't terrified, but I was scared. It was risky. So I said in quite a loud voice, for the benefit of those around, Excuse me, please let me pass. As I said this, people all around looked in our direction. But then my stalker did something unexpected. He turned and ran into the busy street. Right before my eyes, he was hit by a car. You may think this is quite cold-hearted, but I just thought as I rode the train home, that is not my fault. I was kind of happy that the harassment might be all over. In case you're wondering, he lived. However, one of the stalker's colleagues saw this all unfold. This guy said that 
it looked as if we were having a lover's quarrel. And when the stalker got hit by the car, he said that I pretended not to notice, or feigned ignorance and just walked off. This rumor was spread around by the stalker's co-worker. Every year my company and other companies in the same line of work have a sports day for a bit of friendly competition. I remember talking to a few people, but there were so many people I can't remember who I spoke to very well. Apparently this is how I met my stalker. I'm usually really good at remembering faces, but I didn't recognize him. I found out that he came to my company a few times a week. I work in the personnel department hidden away in a small office, so I don't often see people other than the ones I immediately work with. Yet the rumors about me grew. They said that we often met at work. Of course I denied all these false allegations and stated the fact that I was the victim of stalking, but I wasn't convinced that anyone believed me. Another shock was in store for me. I was dumped. Although my boyfriend and I weren't officially engaged, we had set up a date for me to be introduced to his parents in his hometown. And at that point, we would officially announce our plans to engage. The rumors had reached their ears before I had arrived. As I said before, the suffering caused by stalkers wasn't well documented in Japan. They said to me when I met them, you must have given this guy some sign that he had a chance with you. Somehow you must have given him the wrong idea. You caused his actions. Are you sure there wasn't anything going on between you two? With this doubt and distrust imposed upon me, my boyfriend was persuaded by his parents to end our relationship. I couldn't believe it. I wanted to escape, I wanted a fresh start, so I resigned from my job as well. It has been over 20 years since this has happened, and the wounds caused by the stalker still feel fresh. My desire to work hard at the assumption that I would eventually get married and spend my life with a husband has died. I came to the conclusion that I would end up alone. So far I'm right. There is a huge park near my house. On weekends and public holidays it gets really busy. However at night the atmosphere of the park is entirely different. Back when I had just moved into the area I was unpacking. I had so much to do and there wasn't an end in sight so I decided to go to the park for a change of pace. The park had swings and slides, plenty of stuff. Next to a public toilet there was a phone booth illuminated in the darkness that creeped me out a bit. Later when I had finally finished unpacking it was around 1am and decided to go to a convenience store. The whole time I was walking, I felt as if someone was watching me. I didn't want to look over my shoulder at any point. There was the phone booth, ordinarily I would walk past it without paying it much attention, but for some reason I stopped and stared blankly at it. After a few minutes, I snapped out of it and ran to the convenience store and bought a few more things sweets, a bento box and went on my way home. Halfway through the park I realized I was desperate to go to the toilet. It was unavoidable. I had to use the toilet in the park. At that time of night, I was the only one in the park and it was quite frightening. As I was washing my hands I heard a phone ring. I checked but it wasn't my mobile. It was coming from somewhere very close to the toilet though. The payphone was ringing. What perfect timing I thought. Two thoughts entered my mind. The first, curiosity. What if I answer it? The second, fear. Do not answer it. In the end, fear won. I ran back home while the phone rang behind me. Back home, I sat down on my sofa and tried to organize my thoughts. I was still thinking about the phone booth. From my window, I could see the park and phone booth. I wasn't sure if it was still ringing. I watched for a few moments as a man appeared from a nearby toilet. The light of the toilet illuminated him. In his right hand he was holding a mobile phone, and his left, something sharp, like a tool or a knife. It took only two minutes to run back to my house from the park. I was just there. I thought there was no one else in the toilet with me. My suspicion is that the man was waiting in one of the other stalls and dialed the payphone number, and would creep up to whoever answered the phone from behind and murder them. What if my curiosity was greater than my fear? Whenever I think about what could have happened, I shudder.
Last winter, my girlfriend and I had a huge argument while we were driving home late night in the mountainside. She kicked me out of the car and left me there. I thought that she'd come back soon, but she didn't. And to top it off, I realized I left my phone in her car. It was the dead of night, not a single car passed by. So the only option I had was to walk home. I was so annoyed. As I knew where I was on the mountainside, I decided to use a shortcut instead of the road my girlfriend and I drove up on. The grass was long on this road, but I could tell that a car had driven down here recently. Some of the grass was flat. This shortcut probably doesn't get used so much, so I found it a bit strange. It was a hard walk. I was cold and frightened. I wanted to quit. It was horrible. It was late at night and the hillside was so dark, I couldn't really see where I was walking. Then I saw a light. A small family car was approaching. It was behind me. Its bright light shining past me. The car's headlights were warm on my back. Was it running out of gas? Well, whatever. For the time being, I thought I'd at least ask to borrow their phone. I stepped into the middle of the grass road and called out, Um, excuse me. I regretted this idea almost instantly. Without thought, I had plunged myself into potential danger. I had no idea who was in the car or what they were doing in the mountain woods so late at night. What's wrong? A woman's voice called out from the car. I explained the situation and I asked if I could borrow her phone. We're out of the service area, she replied very calmly. With that said, I decided that I wanted to get the hell away from her. Well, uh, I better get going then, I said while I turned to leave. Please help me. By saying these few words, it ensured my escape was impossible. Help me dig a hole. If you help me, just for a moment. After we're done, I'll take you anywhere you want to go. As she said this, her right hand was idly making scooping gestures above her head, as if to cover it. Swinging her hand in that pendulum style made me wonder if I were to refuse, what might happen? I frantically dug a hole with the shovel she supplied. While I was digging, the woman watched and talked to me. I can't remember most of the conversation. Doesn't make any difference now. She seemed to like talking. She was asking me all kinds of questions about myself. I thought it would be a bad idea to give her the correct answers, so I just made them up as I went along. Finally, I finished digging the hole. She went to her car and brought back a bag. I thought I was about to see a corpse, but I was wrong. The bag was overflowing with hair. Too much hair for one person. Uh, are you a hairdresser? I asked nervously. There was no reply, just silence. It was terrifying. She brought lots of items from the car and threw them into the hole that I had dug. There were children's toys, clothes, etc. The last item was a cooler. I was terrified that there might be something in there. A child. My heart started pounding in my chest. By the end of it all, I didn't know what to think. She gave me a ride home, as promised, and it was finished. I began to forget about the incident over time, but this year, I found a paper bag in front of my house. I looked inside, and it was full of hair. I remembered the incident on the mountain and wondered if this could be a coincidence. Surely, surely not. It had to be related. I decided to tell my good friend about the situation, and my story certainly sparked his curiosity. Well, let's go there and dig up what you two buried, he asked. To be honest, I want nothing to do with those bags of hair, I replied. But he said, 
why don't you just tell me where the place is then and I'll go do it myself. And he kept asking and talking about it at work, again and again. It got to the point where I ended up going with him. I didn't want to though, but I felt he shouldn't go alone. One day after work we headed towards the mountains, and he decided to invite another work friend too. Us three drove up the mountain road. There was a chain sectioning off the grass road I had walked down, and my friend got out of the car and unhooked it. The grass had grown a lot since last year. It bent beneath the wheels of the car. It was like we were surfing. I couldn't quite remember where the hole was since it had overgrown now. I thought because of this my friends would just give up searching for the hole. Nope. So I thought I'd just say, oh, here's the hole, in the hope of us digging there, finding nothing, and then we would all go home and it would all be over. But then it occurred to me that anyone would be able to notice the difference between a place that had been dug up. The grass would obviously be shorter and the soil would probably be a different color too. Here it is, my friend said with glee. Park up, shine the headlights in this direction. Let's dig it up, fast, my friend shouted. I wanted to go home quickly, so I didn't protest. I just helped them. With us three men digging, we were able to unearth the things that the woman had thrown away quite quickly. When I helped her bury all that stuff from her car, it was dark and I couldn't see it very well. There were a lot more things than I could remember in the hole. And there was the thing I was the most worried about. The cooler box. My friend wrenched it open. Black water splashed out. My friend dropped it and all the black water sloshed out into the grass. What the hell? My friend said. I was expecting a body, my friend's friend said. This isn't a novel, this is reality, I told him. We filled in the hole and went back down the mountain. On the way back, my friend suddenly started to scream and shout about his hand. He said it felt as if his hand was burning. When he opened the cooler, that black water splashed on his hand. We rushed him to the closest hospital. We got his hand examined and the doctor told us that he had suffered a corrosive burn. He got treated for it and we were all relieved. But in the end, I still don't have the answer of why those things were buried out there in the mountains. The mystery remains a mystery. Nothing was resolved. I guess that's the end of it. I hope so. Thank you all so much for listening. I am really happy to share some creepy stories that you might not have heard. These Japanese stories were translated by myself and you can find more on my channel. So please consider subscribing if you enjoyed this. I like to think that you will find stories that you probably haven't heard before there. I like to try different types of stories between human horror and the unknown. I'm always interested and open to suggestions and I love chatting in the comments. Big thank you to Mortis Media. It's been an absolute pleasure to work with you as well as being introduced to your audience. Thank you all.